Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Michael Anderson, and, and with Robin Ewing, I'm co-director of the CREATE Centre at the University of Sydney. Welcome to what promises to be a magnificent gift from Tasmania uh, today. Uh, really looking forward to this fantastic webinar uh, about puppetry and its application in, in, in lots of different contexts. But uh, before I do that, I just want to uh, acknowledge that we're on uh, Aboriginal land. I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land, uh, land that was never ceded. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So today we've got a real treat. Uh, Tasmania has been a stalwart of arts and arts education for decades and, uh, and sometimes under-recognised for that. And some of my most treasured colleagues uh, come from Tasmania. Uh, and I'm going to introduce one, uh, going to introduce the rest of the team. But one of the great ornaments of Tasmanian arts is Terrapin Puppet Theatre, who have been a long-standing uh, kind of national treasure. And, uh, and it's great that uh, we're talking about them today, and I'm really pleased. I've known about their work uh, for more than 30 years, I think. Uh, ever since I was doing my undergraduate education degree in Tasmania, and I've always been in awe of the work that they do. So I'm I'm thrilled uh, that Create has the privilege of hosting them today. Uh, before I, you know, jabber on about uh, Tasmania too much more, I want to introduce uh, my treasured colleague, uh, Associate Professor Marianne Hunter. Marianne uh, is Associate Professor at the University of Tasmania. Uh, she works in transformation work she, uh, with schools. She works in professional supervision with school leaders. She does such amazing work uh, in all sorts of fields. And to add to that, she's also done some amazing work with Terrapin. I'm gonna hand over to Mary Ann, who is going to uh, introduce the rest of the team and kick off this web webinar for this evening. Thanks, Mary Ann. Oh, thanks so much, Michael. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting across um, nations here uh, in Australia on this on this um, conference together and this gathering together. Um, I am here on the land of the Mornina people. Um, land was never ceded here. Uh, and also the Mornina um, did not survive colonisation, one of the groups in Tasmania that didn't. And yet we've got so many surviving Aboriginal communities and families here on the island who are carrying forward the knowledges and the strengths of our learnings and our understandings of um, the many generations who looked after country, who looked after land, who looked after sea and waterways and communities. And I acknowledge elders past, present, and also those yet to be elders who we may be working with in some of our contexts if we're working with young people. So um, just a quick word um, before we hand uh, the discussion over to the wonderful group here of colleagues here at Terrapin. And one of the reasons why we're here is to celebrate some of their uh, work, not only many, many of us, those of us who come here from arts education backgrounds might be aware of Terrapin's work in schools, which of course is known internationally, um, and their work in uh, community-based contexts. And today we're um, going to have the wonderful opportunity to hear about their wonderful work in aged care. Um, and I'm going to be handing over to some colleagues, Daniel Jackson, um, who is the coordinator of the Forever Young project that we're going to be talking about. Um, and Danielle's a drum therapist counsellor. And I'm just going to read this, Danielle, because I don't want to miss out on the many, many faces of Danielle, because um, Danny's got some um, incredible uh, artistic background in, and quite diverse in that. Um, so she's a drama therapist, counsellor and performer who uses story making and theatre for healing in the areas of ageing, disability, mental health, youth groups and domestic violence. And her practice is born from her extensive professional background and passions as an actor, physical performer and puppeteer. And it's been my absolute delight to be getting to know Danny over the last couple of years as part of this project. Um, so thank you, Danny, for, for sharing this time with us today. We've also got Belinda Kelly, who's the executive producer and CEO of Terrapin. Um, Belinda's worked in the performing arts as a theatre and events producer. 
manager and administrator for over 15 years with a specialty in supporting the development and presentation of new Australian work. Um, so many of you may know her in, again, some guises in the national arts um, community. She's led the growth of Terrapin over the last five years into Tasmania's highest performing arts organisation. We can certainly vouch for that. And again, thank you for joining us today, Belinda. Uh, we also have Laura from Terrapin, who's the Marketing and Development Manager. Um, and Laura has extensive experience in marketing partnerships and fundraising in a range of commercial and creative settings. And one of the beautiful things about um, meeting uh, all the Terrapin folk in their beautiful space at Salamanca is I get the joy of having a natter with Laura um, when I come in and kind of getting a sense of the, the, the massive work there is now in, um, in Terrapin's extended reach internationally and internationally about their work and that's a that's a really incredible kind of team that's been working in there so thank you Laura um, for sharing time with us today as well um, and then as part of today we also have um, Alison Canty with us who's going to be a kind of re a responder to some of the aspects of the project that we'll share today um, Alison is usually located at UTAS um, but is currently undertaking a 12-month residential program at Trinity College, Dublin, as the Atlantic Fellow in Equity for Brain Health. I just want to repeat that again in case anyone didn't get it, because it is the coolest position I can imagine holding anywhere on this planet at the moment. I'm going to say it again. It's the Atlantic Fellow in Equity for Brain Health. So we're very excited to have Alison with us um, and to be sharing some of her work and also kind of sharing some of her perspectives on Terrapin's work um, and giving a sense of um, uh, a kind of a potential pathways forward or pathways beyond um, and through some of this work um, together collaboratively. And also Miriam Vanderberg is joining us too. So Miriam um, joined me in the evaluation process um, that we partnered with Terrapin to create over the last couple of years. And Miriam was on the ground um, and did a wonderful, incredibly wonderful job um, carrying the project, particularly while I, while I disappeared for just a couple of months to travel around this beautiful country um, when I had an opportunity to be on long service leave. So both thank you, a, a national thank you to Miriam um, and also she'll be joining us in the discussion today. So if I hand over to you, um, and basically what's going to happen is we'll have um, we'll have the Terrapin team sharing the project, the background to the project, and some of the insights that they would like to share about the work. Um, then I will um, talk a little bit about the evaluation process that we co-designed with Terrapin um, and some of the insights and kind of emergent um, themes that we were seeing in that work. Um, and then we'll be followed by um, by Alison, who will then talk, respond back to what she's seeing and she's hearing from her um, perspective and also sharing some of the work and some of the connections that she's been um, kind of mindful of and aware of and kind of working in, in creative uh, creativity and arts and brain health. So thank you so much. Over to you, Danny. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Laura's going to drive my slides, so I'll get her to share her screen. I'm on the ready. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and those that are listening later on. I, you did such a robust, comprehensive, poetic uh, acknowledgement of country there, Marianne. I couldn't possibly second that up, but I would just also like to pay my respects to the Palawa Pakna um, on the lands of which we create work. I also work out with the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, so I feel greatly privileged to be um, interacting in that culture, learning about their past, staying in their present and um, being a part of positive change for the future. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a little glimpse of uh, what we're about to talk about today. Here's a photo from uh, our trial process, and I've got a little quote there that I think has been a compass throughout this whole journey that we don't stop playing because we grow old we grow old because we stop playing and of course that's our playwright George Bernard Shaw welcome to forever young uh, we've already done our introduction so I won't spend too much time on that I was just going to briefly say that the order though Laura if you want to go back just again quickly so I'm I'll, I'm going to pass over to Belinda who is going to talk um, specifically about Terrapin and our contribution to the um, artistic landscape 
Then we'll jump back to me. I'll talk more specifically about the program Forever Young. And finally, Laura will close on um, our partnerships and where we're going. Over to you, Belinda. Thanks, Danny. Um, and I'm also zooming in from Palawa country. I'm just going to speak quite briefly about Terrapin and its work um, to put it into context uh, forever young. So Terrapin was established in 1981. Um, we're based in Hobart and we're a touring company, so we don't run a venue. And we make work primarily for children, families and intergenerational audiences. Um, as a touring company, our work is presented in schools in Tasmania annually, usually um, over 16,000 students a year, and we also run a creative learning program in primary schools, and we also present in theatres in Australia and internationally, and also in um, public space, as you can see with this slide, that's a um, large public space uh, work from a couple of years ago, and we make installation work in Australia and um, present that internationally as well. We can reach upwards of 120,000 people um, each year, um, largely due to uh, reach in public space. We present our work at um, venues such as the Lincoln Centre in New York City, the Kennedy Centre in Washington, DC, the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, Dark Mofo, Sydney and Melbourne festivals, and toured widely in the US, China and Japan, where our work is um, often uh, presented in uh, translation. We're skilled collaborators and are often funded by DFAT, who support cultural diplomacy in person to person artistic exchange. And we've also worked with construction companies and gaming companies to present our work. So we have some experience in working outside of our immediate arts uh, space. And just to um, say, in terms of government funding, uh, we're a not-for-profit and a registered charity that we have funded um, by the Australia Council through the National Performing Arts uh, Partnership Framework um, from 2021, which we're invited to join that, um, that funding tier. That's the top funding tier, which holds things like all the state theatre companies, the ballet, the opera. Um, and we were invited into that in recognition of the artistic quality of our work and our impact in the community. But I'd say we were out of the national cohort, which is 30 odd companies, we would definitely be the smallest in terms of turnover, by, by no means though the smallest in terms of impact in our audience um, reach. So we, our core team, which is, we are growing, but we are seven full-time employees. And then we engage many makers and creatives and performers on a project and contract um, basis each year. Uh, our practice is diverse and we make decisions on what we're going to do uh, in response to opportunities and um, also our interests of areas to explore is really based on our purpose and our values. So our purpose is to make lives better through art and culture. And then we do a lot of um, uh, international touring, go to quite prestigious ven venues. Um, the community impact is really the heart and soul of the company. And we also aim to shift realities and connect people through our work. So shifting realities could be obviously the imaginative shift by seeing an, um, an artwork, but also there's interventions um, into um, things like schools and aged care, which have um, sort of a, a different kind of transformation. Uh, every year we hope that every Tasmanian would have the opportunity to see our work either on a school's tour at a festival, at a community events or in theatres, and we work to remove barriers to access, whether they're financial or geographic. So one of the things that we do is aim to, um, we go where our audiences are, so we hunt them down if we think that we're missing out on some people um, being able to experience our work. So it's with that in mind that we understood, came to understand there was an audience we weren't accessing, which was Tasmanians in aged care, who I would say probably aren't generally considered to be audience members, but that's how we thought um, of them when we started exploring this space. And we had no immediate way to access this audience, either financially or through connections to the sector, um, but we sort of kept it on the back burner and bided our time um, until we could um, ex explore in that space. And then in 2021, I think it was, we met um, Danny, who called us from quarantine. Um, obviously, she was <laughs> contemplating her future and <laughs> thinking of moving to Tasmania, but she was on her way to Tasmania and thinking about making um, new connections. And she suggested we meet, which we did in due course once she was released from quarantine. Um, and we found we had a lot in common as a company with Danny in terms of artistic interests um, and also with values, which is very important for this project. 
Then in the same year, an opportunity arose through COVID era funding to apply for an Arts Tasmania New Works for New Markets grant, um, which was $50,000 seed funding. And with this funding, we engaged Danny to work with the company to explore this new aged care um, offer leaning on our experience in schools touring really because that um, schools touring we're really nimble you're presenting um, in a space with no lights um, you operate sound from a, um, a laptop and you can set up and bump out within um, an hour and um, and obviously also Danny's experience in um, drama therapy and aged care and a really unique um, portfolio of skills um, so Danny will go into the project obviously in detail, but to zoom out from an organisational experience um, perspective, to say the experience has had a really profound effect on our practice and um, we're hoping to embed this as a core annual program and to also tour um, to the mainland and to um, share uh, what we've learnt and hope that some of our colleagues um, in the sector also start um, going into this space. One of the questions that um, I think remains as a company the outcome of what we've done to date um, is um, what was originally an add-on to the main experience, um, which was a one-on-one -on -one experience with audience members who are maybe not able to leave their rooms to come to see the main performance in a common space um, and um, audience members with dementia and what the role is for Terrapin is essentially an arts company in that space. We're not an arts and health company, but um, the there was a really significant response and therapeutic impact with those one-on-ones and um, we'd like to keep going there, but it's really, um, yeah, challenged, I think. Um, the, uh, well, the question is, what is an arts company for in that in that space and, and how are we going to go forward with that? But uh, seeing what the impact is, we can't really turn away from it. So that's going to be interesting in the future. Thank you. Over to you, Danny. Thank you, Belinda. So I'm just going to rewind very briefly just to, um, so Belinda spoke about how we came to collaborate, but just to go backwards in time to how it even, because um, how it even came to, how the relationship came to flourish is to understand my background a little bit working as a drama therapy, more specifically um, delivering therapy opposed to program design. So these are two images from uh, working with an organisation um, in New South Wales and this was a project, a community-based project, where I worked across three different day centres to bring the elders' stories into one narrative, which was um, then performed and filmed and professionally edited and um, screened at a, at a cinema, at a Voca cinema, for their family and friends to come and witness. Um, and that program was awarded the Australasian Elder Care, for, Elder Care Award for Best Dementia Care Project 2020. And another example, next slide, would be working more specifically with individual clients. Um, this is an example of a lady that I was working with and we were exploring her heritage. Um, this lady had a past history of trauma and um, we used her cultural um, identity to explore who she was through the projection of puppetry and identity of family structure. Next slide, please. So... If that hadn't started to taste your appetite as to why puppets and how puppets might, um, professional puppets might work in, in an aged care setting, I've made some dots here um, and I'm just going to read them for our audio listeners. The puppets, the potential of puppets, tool for enhancing community engagement, social relationships, communication and increase a sense of agency. Puppets can provide a sense of safety. Puppets are empathetic, empathetic listeners. Puppets enchant us into a world other than our own, which has the capacity to allow people to break down barriers and express themselves. Residents interact with puppets in ways that won't necessarily interact with other people. They express and share intimate parts of themselves. They enter a private world in which the rest of the setting disappears. Next. They offer, uh, puppetry in aged care settings offers a community approach to care through shared and or family experiences, support um, reduction of things like complex behaviours or emotional isolation, can create more sustainable relationships between staff and residents, and has the potential to minimise interventions of pharmaceutical means by incorporating holistic alternative approaches, subsequently improving the well-being of the individual and potentially resulting in a decrease in expenditure for the organisation. Now, a lot of these points I can share in personal antidotes, but as we go on, um, we can you can ask for more of those in the Q&A at the end, but I think you might, you know, those sorts of things will come out as we speak. 
examples, I mean. Let, I think it's probably best seen through words, so let, uh, through visuals. So let's see a little short clip. And I just wanted to sh I wanted to share this because I thought it was quite interesting about the intersectionality of how it all works. The world of a person with dementia, the world of a person without dementia, and meeting in the middle is this kind of imaginary world, the world of possibilities of what a puppet can entail. Being fully conscious and aware that um, puppets can potentially have connotations of being childlike, and that can be a very dangerous area in the aged care setting. So. As I start to talk about the program now, um, I'm, I would like to reiterate that that was always on our minds, that we were very cautiously and carefully taking steps to ensure that we weren't insulting elders in any way with this form. So here we go. So we started developing Forever Young. Belinda went into how we met and then, but at that stage, it was just a little baby. It was a tiny little baby concept. We didn't know what it looked like. We didn't know what to do. We just really wanted to see, was there a place for professional puppetry in aged care settings? So I set out and um, partnered with some numerous homes around Tasmania and um, explored. We explored different forms of puppetry. We explored um, like installation puppetry. So a puppet might sit in the corner and witness if elders would come and uh, see it or interact with it. We tried shadow puppetry. Uh, we took in a, a, a one of our school touring shows. We took the that's a, that was a non-verbal show. It was just a purely a music underscore. We took the entire show into an aged care setting. Um, so we trialed lots of puppetry to see what was what what residents were interested in. We asked them lots of questions about puppetry. What were your puppetry preferences? What didn't you like about puppetry? Uh, what do you remember about puppetry? And obviously this was sparking lots of things like um, Punch and Judy, Punch and Judy, Punch and Judy. <laughs> and they were really adamant that they liked Punch and Judy. And we kept saying, we can't do Punch and Judy. We're a contemporary theatre company. But, um, but we also had to listen to the people. So I'll park that for a minute. I'll come back to Punch and Judy in a moment. But uh, so we, I also went into um, all of our, the number of homes that we were working with. There was probably about eight of them in Tasmania. And I visited them. I, I studied their activity schedules. I would go and attend their, um, their rooms where they held their activities. I would look at the size of the room, the lighting, the accessibility, how long were activities, when, what was the attention span of residents? What were the sight lines like in rooms? So we really wanted, all of that research was very deliberate because we really wanted to ensure that what we're, whatever we were creating came from the residents. Um, we also ran workshops in narrative building. So there was a, a story, a creative writing story making workshop, you could call it, where a number of residents were invited and we broke up in groups and they were they, they told personal stories and then uh, we wove them into one story, similar to that process I'd done with the day centres many years years ago but the extracts of that story actually went into the script of what became the performance we also partnered at this time I'm not going to go into the evaluation because Marianne will talk about that but um, it's important to realize that we were to to ensure that what we were doing was evidence-based and also evaluated professionally we um, had engaged Marianne and UTAS and Miriam with UTAS to um, ensure that, that we were journeying along through this whole process with them so um, after all that research, we went away and we made a model and what the model looked like. Um, maybe next slide. Oh, there's that's the narrative making workshop. That's a picture of that. That's the intergenerational um, performance. We did an intergenerational performance, which was actually, so I'll just talk to that for one second before I go on to the model. The intergenerational, one outcome of that intergenerational experience that was particularly profound was that we deliberately seated them elder young person, elder young person, and that was through a preschool um, that that performance was. But what was gorgeous about that is that the elders would sometimes, and they didn't know each other. Oh, no, sorry. Some of them had met before through a very a different program, but not all. And um, the elder would share parts of whatever was happening in the performance um, to help describe details that potentially the young person didn't know. And then the young person would get really excited and laugh, and that would influence the elder to laugh. And so there was this gorgeous connecting and sharing that was going on. Next slide. 
So the model what the model ended up looking like, and it remains flexible to this day. So whenever I take a booking or whenever we're um, testing the appetite to see if a site would like to make a booking, I always say that we'll work with you. This model is very flexible to whatever is happening in your home. We want to come in and um, we come to you. You don't need to adapt to us. The model is a group performance, which um, within this group performance considers things like reminiscent therapies and um, old world. It uses a lot of old items. So for example, example I noticed when I was in the homes um, doing my observational stuff that sometimes the elders will wander into a room and be waiting for an activity and the activity might take another half an hour but then and that means by the end by the time of the the activity had finished they'd been sitting there for two hours and were probably getting a little bit bored and agitated so we decided that from the very moment the cast enters the site they're on so they're very it's all stylized their their costumes are very determined by this carnival stylized theatrical look they're often singing they create a real ambience of energy in the site from the moment they come in but they'd come in pushing a cart which is modeled off a kind of those ice cream carts I saw them in numerous sites they're a tea cart and then the cart opens and that is part of the performance so even if elders are walking around and wandering to get to their seat they're actually engaged in a in a in a performance in a sort of a creative exchange and there's a lot of clowning and slapstick going on as you can see Brett um, Brett's little face popping up there in the image um, they stuff up they make mistakes so it's really empowers particularly the men the men elders like to say I oh, put it up the wrong way like they really like to get involved and have a say so we really want to make sure that from the second that that the car walks in um, that all of that setup was part of the performance and that group of performance is for anyone that is able is invited to come there but they can also have um, loved ones staff can attend for other family members can attend grandchildren can attend sometimes we had intergenerational audiences like you just witnessed where um, preschoolers would attend as well and I think one further thing to mention there that was really nice about having loved ones a husband or a wife come and experience it together was that, that they had uh, something to talk about that day that was outside of care needs so they had something to talk about that wasn't a domestic task wasn't what you had to for lunch they could share a song because there's a lot of music involved in it um, they can have a laugh they can um, yeah there's something there's they've got something else for that experience for that day one more thing I just want to mention on the Punch and Judy stuff is that we decided we committed to doing Punch and Judy, but we did it our way. And how we did it was through the story of Joan, who is also a puppet. Um, I think you'll see an image of her in a moment. And Joan, um, there she is. And Joan represents an elder who is finding her way into this new home and navigating that experience for herself. So the elders get a projected, get to see a projected version of an elder character as the cent our central character in the story. So these two, Rosie and Brett, are trying to be our travelling troupe, trying to perform Punch and Judy, but Joan keeps interrupting and telling them that that is an outdated version. No one wants to see Punch and Judy, so they never actually get to the crux of Punch and Judy. The other lovely thing about Joan is that we witness her life story. So we get to see the whole lifespan of Joan. Um, we see her ma getting married. We see her meeting a husband, having children, having travel experiences, becoming a nurse. And then at the end, her husband dies. So we, we didn't shy away from those harder topics, which we think elders want to see and are reflected in where they're at with their life stage. That's the shadow puppetry of her life story. Next slide. And they're having a good time. <laughs> Some punch and duty. Um, so what we observed, what I, the second part of the model, so the performance happens in the morning and then the second part of the model is the individuals, the one-on-ones. Now, these are much more therapy-based. They're based off drama therapy theories, um, particularly a Sue Jennings theory, which is embodiment projection and role so before we arrive on site sites are given uh, what we call background profiles and they will nominate who we visit we generally get to see between eight and ten residents per visit on those background profiles the cast will determine based on that theory um, how they might enter the room of course in, trying to be in a very person-centered way that will change and adapt after they meet the resident but it will often provide a roadmap as to which which puppet they might bring. For example, this, this puppet, the cat, um, is very much in the same vein as what pet therapy or robotic therapies might offer, except that you have a human being being reactive and impulsive to the, that resident in that moment. 
So um, just examples that through the video, which you might not have seen, but there was a lady that I was sitting beside. She was actually a palliative care lady and um, was, she was nonverbal. She was lying down and she wasn't, she hadn't spoken for quite a while, but I put the cat beside her. And for whatever reason, that, re that, that cat beside her gave her enough safety to sit up and do almost a stream of consciousness in Polish. So it was, that's what was captured in that video, why I said, remember this. Um, and so you can see that, that the, the benefits of just being able to have the opportunity to project something, I don't know what she said to the cat, but to share something, to express something, to trust, um, which you might not, if you were in that state, might not be able to do with another human being, even a loved one, I think is where the real juice of a lot of the program lies. It's obviously um, an entertainment program, but we do believe that it's drenched in therapy. Um, and the baby is another example of one of the puppets that we use in one-on-one -on -one, and often the baby is used in a role way, similar to the way doll therapies might be used. Um, but I guess because it's such a caricature looking baby that it does create quite a lot of humour and, um, and less attachment with the, with the residents. And um, thank you. I'll pass on to Laura. Thanks, Danny. Um, look, I'll be really quick because I know we're running against time, but I thought um, we'd just chat briefly about the kind of response that we've had from the broader community, um, which I think, as you might expect, has been really um, overwhelmingly positive. Um, you can see here a photo of um, a resident, Desma, being interviewed for 7.30, um, and that kind of um, media attention has been pretty consistent throughout the life of the project, um, both across mainstream media and sector media. So there's been a lot of um, ongoing conversations with our community here in Tasmania about the work and looking further afield. Um, the way that the program kind of sits within Terrapin is that it is, it's entirely beyond our um, core funding. And so it is a project that we're continually fundraising for. It's currently supported entirely through um, philanthropy and corporate supporters um, and we've had over 100 individual donors support the program since um, its inception so I think that gives a good sense of how um, how moving people find it and how enthusiastic they are about participating. Um, and then in terms of where we are going next with Forever Young, we've got a 2024 um, tour planned for Tasmania. So that will run for probably um, close to three months around the state, which is really exciting. Um, and we have our sites site set firmly on the mainland as well to be able to bring it um, across Bass Strait um, and continuing to look for partners to support that program. We're also really interested in um, exploring sort of new modular additions to the program. We've done, recently did a really small pilot of um, an intergenerational workshop, which Danny ran at the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, um, which focused on bringing together a group of young people um, and a group of elders and the young people worked together to retell the stories of the elders through shadow puppetry in a community performance. And we think there's a lot of a, a lot of scope for that kind of intergenerational, sort of more long-term intergenerational connection um, and storytelling. And then we also um, are keen to explore how we can involve lifestyle staff more closely in the delivery of the, of the program, um, because we've seen, particularly with the one-on-ones, the kind of impact that that can have. And, but we can't be there every day and so we wonder what opportunities there are to share the knowledge that we have as performers and theatre makers with lifestyle staff in a way that is sort of valuable and interesting for them so that it might be something they can incorporate into their own care routines. Um, so you know the project has enormous scope for us um, and is has over the past few years clearly become a, a core part of our program. Um, so I think I'll stop sharing now and hand over to you, Mary Ann, to chat a bit more about the evaluation. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, so, um, folks, I, I, 
very you're very welcome to get in contact with us um, to have a look at the evaluation report because really it is just a punctuation of what you've really what you've heard here from um, Danny, Belinda, and Laura about um, about the work. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an insight about how we approach the evaluation, particularly for those of you who are in the in interested in the research side of this, um, and then um, and then pass on. Um, to Alison. I'll just talk a little bit about what was intended, what emerged, what the, in the Forever Young Terrapin intentions. And this was a really important part of the whole evaluation process was to actually spend some time with Danny um, talking about the co-design of the evaluation and understand what the intentions behind the project were, which was really about wellbeing and social inclusion, quality of life and positive ageing. And so we came up with three core questions um, to help drive the evaluation process. And it was what are the old, elder artists' perceptions of the work? In what ways was it accessible, relevant and engaging? And how is it making lives better? And making lives better is a kind of critical um, aspect of Terrapin's own sort of strategic plan. So that was really important for us to be kind of mindful of that while we were thinking through. But one of the really key things for us as an evaluation was thinking about what are the underpinning values for evaluation in, a, in work like the approaches to applied performance, engagement, and then artistic um, development, artistic engagement were really kind of critical if you looked at it as a Venn diagram. That was kind of what was really interesting to me and really important to kind of elevate through the evaluation process. So the underpinning values for us were to evaluate it as an experience rather than as an intervention. So we're really clear that we weren't trying to do a clinical kind of measurement of change in the participants. Um, we're really looking at as an experience. Uh, we also wanted to privilege participants' voice and have their perspective really foregrounded in any of the evaluation we were going to be doing. And we also wanted to look at quality of life indicators as a lens for what was happening, not as a measure. So given the small scope of the evaluation, um, it, it, and we would love to be able to kind of do this more broader in time, but for us, we wanted to see what was resonant in this work with some of our kind of widely accepted quality of life indicators. Um, and th so those were the, the values and the, the approaches that we were taking. So we did a whole heap of data, data harvesting, um, as is listed there. And I'm just going to jump through some of this because, again, I'm very happy to send you through the, the evaluation report, anyone who, who may be listening or interested in some of this part of it. Um, but it was really important for us to do a kind of two steps to our analysis of the data. One was an inductive thematic analysis just to identify those open themes um, in the raw data. And then the second step was to then look back into it again, again, considering the resonance with quality of life indicators. Um, so we spoke to 40, um, Miriam um, mostly spoke to um, 48 older adults um, who completed our post-performance surveys. And, and later on, if you're interested in how we approach that, particularly in the many settings we were in, um, Miriam will be really happy to discuss that um, with, us, with you. Um, all, and 11 older adults were also interviewed. Um, and some of sometimes this was just after the event, but we tried to also capture some of their perspectives a couple of weeks after. Um, and um, consider what was kind of left with them in terms of their experience of the performance. So what emerged for us, firstly, was the older adults perspectives. And as you can imagine, even just from seeing what um, Danny shared earlier, there was just overwhelmingly positive response to the work um, in, in terms of the people that we talked to and interviewed. Um, again, Danny can talk a little bit about later about you know, every individual is different when they want engage with an experience like this. And every minute in a day can be different for um, a person who's experiencing something like this. So often there were factors that were beyond the experience of the performance itself that we wanted to be really careful about what we were trying to claim in terms of any change in mood or any change of perspective that a participant might have. But rather, we really wanted to hear what what adult, older adults actually um, how they wanted to describe their experience. So they um, would uh, often talk about how much they enjoyed the opportunity to laugh, 
Um, they were um, having conversations, as Danny mentioned, with family members, which were beyond the kind of everyday and which kind of enabled a, a much kind of more lightened kind of connection to be evident um, to them in talking with their family members. They really appreciated that the program was created, especially for their age cohort, the number of folk who were really surprised and really chuffed by that. This was made just for us. Like it hasn't been someone who's come in and done, you know, um, done a performance that is, um, has been just kind of wheeled into the uh, into an aged care facility or residence it was really made for them and that was they were greatly appreciative of that uh, and there just a um, there were very few comments or when we asked them you know what they would change or how it might be different there were very very few who mentioned it but those who did were really keen to either have more interactivity so for those people who were who had just seen the performance in the morning um, they were keen for a little bit more interactivity and again this is only one or two folk who mentioned this um, and those who didn't get to experience it with the children wanted to be involved intergenerationally um, with an opportunities as well and here are just some quotes for Pete from those participants And there again, those top two quotes are for those who saw the um, performances in a group and the bottom there from those who were in the room performances. And that beautiful sense of, I found it so enjoyable because the fact they came to my room and made me special was kind of really key for, for some of the participants. And that beautiful sense of, um, it gets you out of your belief zone to believe in a little bit of magic, if you like. So again, um, I'm just going to, go through these um, and again very happy to pass on to those because I'm really keen to have Alison share this time and her perspective with you but just to alert you or, or draw your attention to two more things um, one was that the that the when we're looking at quality of life resonance we identified the resonance with these um, with these aspects of quality of life so the experience that experience, express or manage feelings, increase knowledge and valuing of self, participate in interactive relationships, informal learning, um, exercise cognitive processing and brain function, engage imaginatively and appreciate quality and beautifully, beauty. Now, the thing about the, our focus on this resonance is that we were starting to see some really beautiful kind of nuance and kind of granular aspects of some of the participants' comments that then again elevated our interest and our curiosity about how to in, in, engage in research around quality of life indicators a little more. So, for example, um, one of the folk who were experiencing dementia said of, to, of holding the puppet, I held it when it went to sleep. I felt good. Uh, and for me, that was really interesting. It was like, it felt good. I felt good. Um, another one, she was soft. She was sleepy. So the the um, the puppet, gentle, the coming, this coming together business. So this kind of really interesting kind of inter perceptions of what this puppetry was, a uh, puppetry experience um, was for, for those who were experiencing it. And then these words from, from Danny, um, which she mentioned before, also that sense that you're genuinely in the moment that it is such a different experience than having something like pet therapy or robotics in those um, environments because you have the puppeteer being responsive and is, there is that human dimension so that was the final point i guess elevate through the evaluation is that, um, and this comes from the, I guess, again, the values of evaluate. What is the impact in terms of health or, you know, what, what is the use of puppetry, but rather what is this project doing in terms of really deepening and expanding our understanding of what it also means to create this kind of performance at that intersection of creativity and health. And here was this great scaffolding for artists, which um, Danny has already mentioned, by using Jennings embodiment projection role model as a scaffold for artists moving into that space who weren't drama therapists or trained drama therapists, actually gave them a, um, a framework and a scaffold for their improvisational work. So looking at from an uh, artistic perspective and an artist's development perspective, 
he you've got an opportunity to be again looking at this as an artistic experience and the development of the artistic work of Terrapin which again sits in their strategic plan is something that's really critical in their work with communities is about developing and expanding what it means to be uh, working in puppetry in these environments so I'm going to finish off there um, uh, and again, very happy for anyone who would like a little bit more um, to know a little bit more about the project through the evaluative lens. I'm very happy to pass that report on to you. I'm now going to give you over to um, the wonderful uh, Alison Canty. Um, and you will have to excuse me. I'm actually in a music room in a high school at the moment. And my beautiful daughter is just about to give her last performance as a high school student for the year, for her whole of high school, and I have promised not to miss it. It is a clash that was completely unavoidable. So I'm going to go up and see her perform now in two minutes. So thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening, and I'm going to catch up with the recording um, when we finished. And I'll be passing um, then Alison over to Robin to um, facilitate the discussion. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marianne. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Oh, so nice to hear about this um, initiative and this experience that you've created through Terrapin and sort of with the help of the um, valuation from UTAS. Such a pleasure to hear about this great work. It's really meaningful and it's very important work. So it's really good that you have this opportunity amongst all those others in the media, you know, to share to share the work that you've been doing. So I was you know, really pleased. That was the first impression that I had listening just now. Um, so my name is uh, Alison Canty. I'm an Associate Professor down at the University of Tasmania. I'm currently an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health based at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Um, I'm in the Global Brain Health Institute, which is um, an institute that was set up in 2015, uh, really dedicated for protecting the world's ageing populations and addressing inequities in how um, our older people are cared for. Um, and considered. And there are two sites for our centre, one's at University um, California, San Francisco, which has um, a really clinical focus. And then there's another site at Trinity College Dublin, where there's much greater emphasis on exploring creativity and health and creativity and brain health. And that's where I'm based uh, this year. Um, we're really interested not only in brain health, but in dementia, uh, which is uh, probably why I'm here today, since you've had this experience in the aged care setting. And just for those of you who are um, unaware about the, the prevalence of dementia, around the world, there's one new case diagnosed every three seconds. Um, it's not quite this uh, rapid in Australia. We have fewer people. And also, it seems like the incidence of dementia is going down. So the number of people per 100,000 who are diagnosed is decreasing in some parts of the world, but the prevalence is going up. There are more and more of us and we're living longer. So we're seeing large um, increase in the people living with dementia around the world. And the current numbers, you know, are on their way up to, you know, above 50 million, and we're looking at 152 million by sort of 2050. We have no effective cures or treatments. There's been a lot of um, excitement in the news recently with these amyloid-based immunotherapies, but they're largely inaccessible for most of the world, unless you're extremely rich and you have you live next door to a, a well-resourced hospital. So we're really looking for other ways to try and help. Um, to help um, provide dementia care, therapy care, um, improve quality of life, and even to prevent the onset of dementia altogether. And that's where sort of creative therapies come in. And there's a really a large amount of interest around the world at the moment and some really good programs uh, developing. Um, a lot of the ones I know about are in Europe, but there's also some great work going on in Australia and in other parts of the world. And these sort of creative therapies can be low cost and they can uh, be applicable in low resource settings and they're also scalable. So um, when I was listening just now, I was really struck um, by some of the stories uh, that you shared and how, you know, this creative approach using puppetry, I mean, it's, it seems to have touched on lots of existing therapies in the dementia care space, like reminiscence therapy, um, storytelling, um, life story work, uh, pet therapies, doll therapies, you know, and that was, it really struck me that you have managed to pick up on a lot of those, but done it in a really unique uh, way, you know, in the context, using, you know, your own background as, you know, working with puppetry and then in the context of the Tasmanian aged care system and it's really difficult to get into the aged care system there are lots of rules and regulations and I applaud you for you know making such good progress and, and generating that access at a time when it's you know been more difficult rather than less difficult 
Um, but some of the things that came to mind when I was uh, reading about your program and hearing about it are some of, you know, how the brain can respond to creativity and, you know, different approaches outside of, you know, traditional medicine. And I'm just going to play a couple of videos. You may have seen this one before. I'll just play a few seconds of it. This is a story of a former ballerina who is living with quite advanced stages of dementia and she used to dance um, Swan Lake. And I'll just play the first few seconds of it. Um, hopefully it's going to work for us. Can you hear the sound? Yeah. Um, this lady used to be a dancer and she's listening to the music that she used to dance to as a professional dancer. And having you know, been sitting in um, her chair there, she doesn't move very much, she's non-verbal, but she's really able to respond you know, to the touch and the care of um, this man she's with and to the music. And you'll see in a moment, she really starts to respond. This video always makes me cry. <laughs> um, and there's another video there that I, <laughs> Danny's also got some tears. There's another video there, which I don't think I've got time to play, but is uh, the story from one of the other Atlantic fellows in brain health. She's a music therapist working in Scotland, and she's telling a story um, about how when she's played some music to a man who was in the very advanced sort of palliative stages of dementia, how he was able to hear and detect the music and to hum along with her. And they had this really beautiful exchange, uh, similar to, you know, some of the work that you described with the, the pets, the cat the puppet that was the cat. Um, and it, you know, really makes me think um, what we know about dementia is that particular parts of the brain will degenerate early in the disease process, but the rest of the brain is largely intact. And there are some cases, um, let's see if I can just go to my next slide. There are some cases in some types of dementia where creativity and creative expression actually gets enhanced in the disease process. And there's um, some of the semantic dementias are like this, where you have... Um, Semantic dementias are people who get cognitive decline in the areas of language. So they might have um, verbal fluency issues or word finding issues, um, but other parts of the brain might be intact. And there's sort of a, across the scientific literature at the moment, there's a, a growing number of cases of people who have these semantic dementias, their frontotemporal dementias, um, where you get this explosion of creativity, usually in visual arts, but not always, um, where you uh, there's about 14%, 10 to 14% of people with this particular semantic dementia across the world that we know of uh, will start painting or will start playing music. And they do this initially in quite um, an unnoticeable way, maybe, that's not really noticed by the families or the carers, but this explosion in creativity is happening at the same time as other parts of the brain are degenerating. And this one case that I'll share with you is the case of a lady called Anne Adams, who was a brilliant uh, biological scientist, and she developed frontotemporal dementia at the age of 54. And she, um, she used to paint um, at home with her son, and she was, by all accounts, not a very good painter. She used to paint strawberries, apparently. Um, but then in her mid-50s, she started getting more interested in painting, and she started um, painting some really remarkable pieces that her husband at the time didn't really understand. Um, and this is one example here. This painting is actually one long, thin painting. Um, and she was spending a lot of her time listening to Ravel's Bolero, the famous piece of music that he composed um, towards the end of his music career. Um, I can't sing myself. <laughs> so if you're not, not familiar with it, you might have to look it up. But she was listening to this music over and over again, and she ended up transforming this music into um, a piece of art. And you can see these little boxes just here. Each one of these boxes represents a bar of music. And as the music gets faster and faster and louder and louder, you can see each um, these little sort of things that look like buildings get bigger and darker and and more prominent. And if you listen, if you follow along with your eye as you listen to the music,
music you can really see the crescendos and where it's um sort of softer music and louder music that's represented in this visual form and it just makes a really interesting story it's picked up by one of the other atlantic fellows in brain health equity jake broder and he's written a screenplay about it it's called unraveled it's available on youtube and i've put the link at the bottom of this slide if anyone wants to watch it and it's about the story of this lady and this creativity as it sort of exploded in her or you know a emerged at the same time that she was experiencing this type of dementia and there's a little bit in the literature now but it's really just you know something that we're we're still learning about um but it just tells you really that you know people living with dementia and even sort of older people as some processes start to slow down you know others are still intact and there's really a lot of power in creative approaches to improve quality of life uh, for people living with dementia because what well, in the absence of any medicines or any cures for this growing population of people around the world creative therapies are something that can be easily applied um, in a range of different ways and can bring a lot of pleasure and joy to people living with dementia and you know really in this this current era when you get a diagnosis of dementia in the past it's go home and get your affairs in order there's nothing we can do um, but now we're starting to diagnose dementia or some of us are not myself, I'm not a clinician, but with a, a sense of hope and joy and people are, you know, encouraged to go home and do the things they enjoy and uh, to spend time on things that they that they love and so that they can really exercise parts of their brain that are still intact and to try and really promote brain health and optimise their brain health for the parts of the brain that are still working rather than to have a deficit model of care where you're always trying to fix, you know, things that are going wrong. Um, and so when I was listening today um, about the presentation and the work of Terrapin it was really good to see that you know this is a really good example of how you can work with people um, older Australians and in an aged care setting people living with dementia and really bring some joy and hope for them um, at a time when there is um, not really very much and um, I guess one of the other things that I was really struck with and today was the amount of research that you did, Danny, when you went into the aged care homes and you looked at the spaces and you met with the people and you really talked about what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. And that sort of co-design process is also really powerful and is the way that the, you know, the field is moving in um, a lot of parts of research, social research and also dementia research is to really involve the people with dementia in, you know, generating experiences and co-designing you know here it's an experience in other cases it might be a health intervention so it's really pleasing to see that it makes a really good example for the rest of us to follow to do that work and then to um, approach the really difficult um, evaluation of these kinds of um, experiences because they're not really part of the traditional evaluation approaches that you know the governments understand or that you know um, clinicians understand so it's you know it's really a, a fight that we need to have and we need to get better at evaluating these kinds of experiences so that we can really drive change in policy and you know generate you know better quality of life for people living with dementia Robin I'm probably out of time would you like me to stop there otherwise I was going to move into something something different well um I think everything that you've um said has been you know of great interest um, to all of us as well so thank you Alison yeah okay um, I'll stop there yeah well, perhaps we perhaps we could see there hasn't been any questions or comments in the chat um, perhaps we could see if someone would like to to ask a question uh, unmute ask a question make a comment um, if, if not any of our presenters might like to um, add something else that they didn't get a chance to talk about before I would like to ask if I may, there was mention of by by Terrapin people of uh, modularizing. Sorry, that's a terrible use of language there. I, I'm wondering about um, your hopes for the for making this replicable and perhaps um, dispersible. I don't want to just say expandable because I don't mean just you being responsible for everything. What I mean is, um, do you have hopes that this could be uh, formulated into something that, that could be generated in other places? I'll start, um, but Laura or, Laura or Belinda, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, the short answer is yes, <laughs> always. Um, and we do have lots of ambition in lots of different areas. And I guess it always comes down to money, but where we're actively looking at those to make it more sustainable. I suppose that's what the question is, 
is asking like how and I guess that's on our minds as well how do we so we've got these lovely experiences but how do we have sustained impact or how do we revisit homes and what would that look like um, and the, the short answer is that in an ideal sense we have the forever young program and then there would be branches off the forever young program so there would be the educational components where we could have modules that support staff in implementing these sorts of interventions on a daily basis on a needs be basis then we would have a performance element where we would uh, generate a new show every year or so um, tour of Tasmania and also we have we are already in conversations about how we can take a show like that to the mainland um, to a lot of you lovely people and then um, the intergenerational workshop so Laura touched on that NADOC program that we ran that was that had really great successful outcomes and we've got ideas of how we can replicate that into homes as well so um, and that's just the start of it so I do think the yes we we have lots of ideas of how um, it, we can have sustainable impact and how we can actually build on what we've already got it's just a time. It's just going to take some time to make that happen. Is there anything to add, Laura or Linda? Well, I would have thought time and resources, more funding, that will be very important too. Yes? Always. Yes. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, there's uh, a couple of great comments here. Um, before Ter I'm going to ask Terry for you to 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 share your comment but Alison did you just want to make a comment about adding to to what Danny has said around workforce training yeah I was yeah I was just going to say I mean that's a really big thing but you know it's most of the people who are caring you know for older Australians or people living with dementia they're either you know paid at minimum wage as personal care workers in the residential aged care setting or community setting or their family carers who have you know who are unpaid and it's really hard to reach those people and to encourage them to undertake, you know, training and education. You know, mm. my experience is that they really want to do a better job, but they're unprepared for it. So mm. it's, you know, it's thinking about ways that you can get, you know, simple educative sort of approaches out there to reach that group so that they can take something with them and try and implement it in their own home. You know, it's not really a business model <laughs> for Terravan, yeah. but it would be a way to scale up and to really, you know, enable this kind of approach to you know, to move forward. Yeah, we definitely, Benefit that's definitely something we're um, keen on doing. We've, we're seeking some funding to yeah. experiment with that, with workforce training. Yeah. But, um, we haven't really yeah. thought about that um, with um, like family carers. So that's something else to um, yeah. put in the mix. But, and we don't know if it's possible. I think we were a bit resistant to it um, initially because the actors we work with, they've might probably gone to drama school for three years. Yeah. And, we're well, wondering how can we train like lifestyle coordinators to, um, to mm. deliver some of this one-on-one -on -one experience. But yeah. then the what is happening is people are, are trying to do that with no training at all mm. and yeah. using really <laughs> crude puppets or even the doll therapy, not having any um, sort of training in that. So we know mm. that we can improve, I think, what is um, what the current standard is. So um, we've got over our <laughs> reservations about thinking only <laughs> trained uh, puppeteers can deliver this and yeah. hopefully we can get some funding to explore there. And it may not be a fruitful path to go down, but we're mm -hmm. um, pretty keen to see um, what happens there. Yeah, it'd be interesting to chat with you another time about that because we specialise in online education packages. So we might be able to help you to create that and get no, it out there. Yeah, that'd be programs. great because yeah. delivery is a is a, and geography is one of the it's tough to sort out. Yeah, great. Thank you. I think it's worth mentioning that part of that um, conversation started because I was in a site and witnessed a doll, one of the dolls used in the doll therapy, arrive because it was newly purchased, and a last um, team member got it out from its feet. Um, I, I must say I've also seen some highly skilled lifestyle team members, of course, but this one pulled it out by its feet and just passed it over and put it onto a lounge. And um, I guess that's that this is puppetry. These are the principles of puppetry, breathing life into something, endowing something, actually role modelling that this thing has life to pass it on. And it's such a simple concept, but um, I guess it needs training. It does need training. Yes. Yeah. Like that. Um, yeah. I just have seen Maxine's written a question yes. that I think is really a good one. Yes. Um, did Danny, did you experience any residents becoming triggered from the sensory experience and engaging with puppets? Yes, we did. Um, in the explorations, thank, so we piloted what we were doing before we actually took it out. 
Um, we, and it's probably worth mentioning that we piloted what we did with sites that were already a part of the process of exploring the different forms of puppetry. But in this particular interaction, um, the cast, and also just remembering that the cast is new to the setting, so they're also navigating what that looks like and learning lots of skills very quickly. Highly skilled performers, um, and actually uh, two of them have a lot of experience in working in other, other similar set settings and the third one already in aged care. So it's not that they come blind, but just a different, a different sort of way of working. Um, but there was these three women sitting in a in the corridor and, they, and the cast walked past with the baby puppet. Um, it was an impulsive interaction. It wasn't a scheduled, like I spoke about those background profiles. They weren't meant to meet these people in the sense that they didn't know anything about these residents. So they didn't actually know what were um, areas of potential danger or unsafe zones, what were trigger points. And so, um, but these three women sparked interest. And so there was an opportunity, an invitation, and uh, I would never shy away from invitation personally, and neither did they. So um, they walked over, they started doing um, very gentle, very sensitive work. Uh, one lady was holding the baby. Then that lady started to share with the other women um, the wisdom of motherhood. And that was all very lovely exchange and communication. Um, and they stayed for a number of minutes and then the puppeteers took the puppet back with the whole endowment that I just talked about earlier on with the doll therapy, took the puppet back um, and walked on to see the residents that they were scheduled to see. I happened to be there because I was taking notes. I was like the supervisor in the corner and I was taking notes of the cast and I noticed that that woman that had, was holding the baby a moment ago became very distressed and was saying, they've stolen my baby, they've stolen my baby. Um, so luckily that I was there, so I was able to sit with her and calm her down. And um, unfortunately, I'm very ashamed to share that I did use distraction or diversional therapy techniques, but I, was, I didn't know this lady, so I didn't know anything about it. So we did that and she was fine moment. And then I walked off to meet the cast and came back to check on her. So that was a huge learning for us. There was a huge learning that in the moment the puppet might be presenting something that is a really lovely exchange and a connective or an expressive exchange. Um, but how do we safeguard the residents after we leave in the sense that we're removing that experience from them? So what we did was create very three clear roles in those three, there's three casts that go around. There is the performer, there is the, fo the performer is the puppeteer, the puppeteer, the foil, who is the person that interacts with that, that they're the person centered they're not a therapist, but the person-centred person that is interacting with the um, resident or the elder. And then there's what we call uh, the sweep. Now, the sweep hangs back. The sweep watches what's going on. They don't go in the room because we want to ensure that that's an intimate experience and we're not overcrowding residents with um, too many bodies. But after the, um, the puppeteer and the foil have moved on to visit the next person, the sweep will go in and just check in and say, hi. The sweep might sing a song if they're able. The sweep might just introduce themselves, have a short chat, just change the mood a little bit. Um, and that was our way of safeguarding anyone that did become triggered. Right. Oh, thank you. That was very, very um, informative, Penny. Um, Terry, I, I wonder if you'd like to unmute and, and read your comment. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Terry from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I just my comment was basically just expressing enormous gratitude. This was it felt like soul food. Um, I've worked a bit in reminiscence theatre. I work in arts education. I did psychology and drama. So it just felt like it was all the things that speak to my heart coming together in one in one place. So it was just really gratitude. Thank you. This work is absolutely outstanding. Thank you so much. I just thought, Terry, that that was a wonderful summary from all of us. I, I think it has been a, a just amazing presentation. And I'm sure that that many of you like me will be watching the YouTube again because there was just so much um, for us to learn about and hear and wonder at. And it it is wonderful work in especially you know as um you know aging and dementia and and uh, and what's happening does often leave people um 
you know, with a lot of negativity and unhappiness. And yet the, the idea that that there can be creativity enhanced, that it can bring joy and wonder and hope is just fabulous. So, you know, we would just like to congratulate all of you on this amazing work. And I think all of us will will want to very to to be kept in touch with what happens next. And Alison, thank you too for for sharing your um, knowledge and expertise about um, uh, and what you're doing. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we probably should have tried to schedule a longer session, but um, you know, just just thank you so much from the Create Centre and from all of all of those who've been able to tune in both tonight, but. Um, you know, in in the weeks and and months to come, because it will be on the YouTube. And Anna, thank you for coordinating this. And Anna will get the the YouTube up, the recording up as soon as she can. And she's also said that she'll make sure that the links to those videos um, are, are underneath as well. Um, can I say one last thing? So sorry. Yes, I'm please do. I, I, she's going to get embarrassed, but I I just wanted to put a shout out because. Um, Actually, my mentor is in here and she didn't realise it, but I don't think she realised that she's been a big influence in my life. So shout out to Maxine where it all started. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Maxine, as well. And thank you, everyone from Terrapin um, and Alison and all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.